the homeostatic mechanism of the body for controlling the pH and um, acids based in the lungs um, is important to know because it's something that comes up in anesthesia again and in more critical care settings where we are doing um, blood gases to determine um, acid base and where that disruption may be coming from in terms of respiratory alkalosis or um, acidosis or is it a metabolic acidosis or alkalosis. So speaking in terms of respiratory, um, the CO2 is a lot of the partial pressure that is responsible for um, the pH and the acid uh, alkaline function. So um, this is kind of the same range within a bunch of the different values, but the normal pH of blood is 7.4 to 7.45, and that is a factor of 10. So that is the same in um, in your expired um, CO, if you have, a, or CO2, sorry, if you have a um, capnograph, it's always by a factor of 10. So it is similar there, it is 35 to 45. Um, so if you can remember that factor of 10 and 35 to 45, then you will hopefully remember um, because it's really close to the pH of blood too. It's just Seven is in front of that 35 to 45. So the upper uh, and lower respiratory tract, um, upper respiratory tract includes everything that is outside of the lungs. So um, all the way up to the nose, nares, um, larynx, pharynx, all of that. And the lower respiratory tract is the structures within the lungs um, so alveolar, or alveoli, sorry, and um, those lower bronchial tree, um, bronchioles, etc. The lining of the nasal passages has a pseudostratified columnar epithelium. It also has cilia, mucus, and blood vessels. So the cilia and mucus is what is responsible for trapping and um, delivering uh, foreign material that shouldn't be in there back out. So when you cough or um, sneeze, but mainly coughing for the cilia and mucus, um, that is the cilia moving the mucus that has the trapped um, foreign bodies or even irritants and bringing it back up. Um, the main function is also to warm, humidify, and filter air that is coming in. So some more um, pronunciation basically here, but the um, larynx uh, is also the voice box, but we don't really refer to it that way in animals, um, but it is supported, supported by the hyoid bone, um, which if you see on x-ray can look like a foreign body if you're not familiar with what it looks like. Uh, it is made mainly of cartilage and segments. So the epiglottis, um, the arytenoid cartilage, the thyroid cartilage, and the cricoid cartilage, those are all structures that you see when you are passing an endotracheal tube and um, you may have to lift the epiglottis out of the way so you're able to view the arytenoid and um, cartilages and those are the two cartilaginous um, structures on the right and left when you are trying to pass a tracheal tube, endotracheal tube. So the trachea or the windpipe, which we don't really refer to it as the windpipe, um, I think that is Kind of commonplace maybe for human medicine, but um, trachea is a wide short tube with fibrous tissue and smooth muscle held open by cartilage rings. Um, this is where in the video posted by Dr. Dave, um, you should always be able to feel the trachea and you should not be able to feel the esophagus unless there is a tube in that esophagus and then you should feel the two tubes. So the cartilaginous rings um, are what hold open the trachea 
and they extend from the larynx into the thorax where it divides or bifurcates um, into the two different um, bron bronchial, um, so left and right bronchii. Um, the bifurcation of the trachea here in this picture shows the uh, left bronchus, um, it doesn't, all well, the right bronchus is there, but it's not pointed out. Uh, that further goes down the bronchial tree um, into bronchioles and then leading into the alveolar ducts um, and then to the alveolar sacs. So it goes into several different um, furcations, but there's only one bifurcation. So that is the trachea bifurcating, which means um, two splitting. So it bifurcates into the left and right bronchus. So the lower respiratory tract is the bronchial tree, and that includes the bronchi, bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli. Um, so everything extending basically down from the uh, trachea is the lower respiratory tract. Within the bron bronchial tree, uh, the autonomic nervous system controls the diameter of tubes by adjusting muscle fibers in their wall. So this is the smooth muscle that they're referring to. And um, this can cause bronchodilation when um, you're needed to run or um, just get more air in. Um, so not in everyday living situations where you're just breathing at rest, but if you're running or just needing an increased capacity of air and bronchoconstriction. Um, so to constrict those bronchioles and make them smaller which can be something that is needed just for regular respiration, or it could be because of something like asthma, where the bronchi bronchial constriction is so tiny or great that it's actually causing airway constriction. So the alveoli are tiny thin walled sacs surrounded by capillaries, and um, they are lined with a layer of fluid called surfactant. And this is basically kind of a soapy substance that allows um, contraction and expansion of the alveolar um, so that they are able to stay expanded um, and not collapse in on, each, on themselves, basically. Um, and it also has the external respiration that takes place in the alveoli. Um, oxygen and carbon dioxide are exchanged between the blood and the air. Um, so this is where the epithelium is that one um, epithelial cell level, layer only so that the exchange of carbon dioxide and oxygen only has to go through that one um, cell lining basically so it can happen easily and freely. So the lungs are divided into lobes. Um, there are two lungs and two lung lobes. Um, so again, in your textbook, it says that the left lung has three um, parts and it does not. It has two in most of the animals, um, exception for the horse, but it still doesn't have three in the horse. So there are two lobes in the left lung. There's a cradle, cranial and a caudal uh, lobe. And within the cranial lobe, it's further divided into a cranial part and a caudal part. The right lung lobe has four lobes, a cranial, a middle, a caudal, and an accessory. Um, there is a hilus, which is, which is a small, well-defined area on the medial side that allows um, blood and lymph nerves to enter and leave the lungs. So the pulmonary circulation is uh, receiving deoxygenated blood um, from the lungs. So it's coming from the right ventricle of the heart through the pulmonary artery. And uh, the vessels flow, follow a branchial tree and subdivide into capillary networks that are surrounded by the, or surrounding the alveoli. And this is where the carbon dioxide and oxygen are exchanged. And then it is sent back out from the pulmonary venule to the pulmonary arterial and then to the pulmonary um, vein where it goes into the left side of the uh, heart atrium.
The mediastinum is the portion of the thorax between the lungs that contains the heart, trachea, esophagus, blood vessels, nerves, and lymphatic structures. And on a ventrodorsal or dorsal ventral um, x-ray view, you can see that um, as a small kind of area above the heart. Um, so it is something that is viewable on an x-ray and um, you can have a pneumomediastinum if there is air that is surrounding that area. Um, my dog actually had a thymoma. Um, the thymus in small or young animals is there, but um, it can also grow into a tumor. Luckily it was benign, but um, she had a really large tumor in the mediastinum area. So her mediastinum on x-ray was quite large. Negative intrathoracic pressure is a partial vacuum that exists within the thorax. Um, so there is no um, air surrounding the outside of the lungs. There's a vacuum there that actually allows the lungs to be pulled tightly against the thoracic wall. Um, it also allows lungs to follow movements of the thoracic wall and diaphragm in inspiration and expiration. And it aids the return of blood to the heart because there is um, pressure that is being put on um, those structures because of the vacuum that's there. Um, so because veins have no muscular pump, it actually facilitates the process of getting blood back to the heart. Respiratory volumes is something that will come up again in anesthesia. So tidal volume, minute volume, and residual volume. Um, these are what we use to describe uh, the volume of air that is inspired and expired during one breath. So that is the tidal volume. The minute volume is the uh, air inspired and expired during one minute. So it is a calculation that is done by multiplying the tidal volume by the number of breaths per minute. So in your textbook, they have an example with an animal that has a tidal volume of 450 milliliters um, that is taken in in 12 breaths. So that animal's minute volume is the 450 milliliters of air times 12 breaths per minute, which equals 5.4 liters. The residual volume is the volume of air remaining in the lungs after maximum expiration. So no matter how, how, how hard an animal tries, the lungs can never be completely emptied of air, and this volume of air that is left in the lungs after expiration is known as the residual volume. The alveolar gas exchange is basically the gradient coming into play again, where there are levels of high O2 and low O2 and high CO2 and low CO uh, high sorry low CO2 and high CO2. So if there is an area where um, in the blood, there is a low O2 content and a high CO2 content that passes by the alveoli and um, that alveoli contains a high O2, low CO2, so the opposite. Um, so it's easily passively exchanged um, in that process there. So um, the high O2 wants to go into the area of low O2 and conversely, the high CO2 wants to go to the area of low CO2. So um, that is where the gas exchange is made when the blood is passed through that capillary bed um, next to that alveoli and that exchange is made. Um, we breathe out the CO2 that was in the um, vein at that point and the oxygen we had breathed in passively diffuses into that capillary bed and is sent out um, uh, to the capillaries with uh, high oxygenation and low content of CO2. This is once again talking about partial pressure. Um, so the theory of a uh, mixture of gases is the sum of the pressures of each individual gas. Um, when we're talking about partial pressures in blood, we're talking about the dissolved um, oxygen and dissolved CO2 content. 
and they just use the word pressure. So um, in the blood of capillaries, it's determined by the partial pressures of O2 and CO2 in the air. So that is the oxygen and carbon dioxide that is in the alveolar sac um, relating to the oxygen and carbon dioxide that is dissolved in the blood capillaries. There is a mechanical control breathing system and a chemical control system for breathing. So the mechanical is operated through stretch receptors in the lungs and it is preset by the autonomic system, meaning that we don't have to consciously think about breathing. It is done by the mechanics preset. Um, we can obviously take over that at one point, but um, as the textbook said, if you were to try to hold your breath, um, doing that by physically uh, manipulating the system, it would kick back in and make you start breathing again. So that is the um, autonomic system taking control. Um, so the muscle contractions that produce um, by inspiration are stopped. The muscle contractions that produce expiration are initiated. And a set of nerve impulses is sent when lungs deflate to a certain point, which is telling us to start breathing again. Um, this is the net effect of normal rhythmic resting breathing and a baseline pattern. So this is what we're seeing um, when somebody is sleeping in normal rhythm um, and when somebody is at rest. The chemical control system for breathing is um, something that is done by chemical receptors that monitor the blood. They are located in the carotid artery and the aorta and the brainstem. So when the CO content, or CO2, sorry, content in the carotid artery or aorta is at a certain level or the pH is at a certain level or the O2 content is at a certain level, it'll tell us to um, breathe. So this is something that is explained with your bagging of a patient under anesthetic. If you over bag a patient, you are hyperventilating them, meaning you are delivering too much oxygen and those carotid um, receptors and uh, aortic receptors are now having, there's too much oxygen, so they are turned off and they are not telling us to breathe. Um, so that is what the apneic part of overbagging would do. Um, conversely, if there is too much CO2, um, so the animal is holding its breath, that will tell those receptors to tell the brain stem to tell us to start breathing um, so that we can get rid of that CO2 content and get the O2 um, gas exchange to become more normal. Um, and the pH relation there is that if there's too much CO2, then the blood is acidic. And um, that also tells the brainstem that we need to breathe to be able to raise that pH to make it more alkaline. This further is talking about acid base control within the blood. So the um, effects of CO2 within the blood or um, hypoxia, so not breathing. Um, so the respiratory center would signal to increase the rate and depth of breathing. And the depth is important as well because um, hyperventilation could be an increased rate and they are not breathing in deeply so that um, they look like they're breathing and the rate is increased, but their actual uh, exchange of gas isn't good because the depth is really shallow. So they're not getting a good draw of breath in for that gas exchange to happen. In severe hypoxia, the neurons of the respiratory system become so depressed that the impulses cannot be sent to the respiratory muscles anymore. And this is what can happen when they become completely apneic or stop breathing. 